Over the last five lessons has been talking about the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, when I was thinking about what should I teach about, well, guess what? I'm going to teach on the second advent. Last week he said that he had wrapped up his lessons for the time being on that. And so what I'm going to try to do is, is go through and give you a big overview of the event of the second advent. It'll be brief, it's going to be quick, we're really going to be moving, so uh, I had to ask the Lord to teach me how to bridle my tongue, and uh, he gave me a bridle. <laughs> so, here it is. So I'm going to restrict my remarks. You know what a blabbermouth I am. I'm going to try to restrict my remarks to what I've got down here, what I've studied out and prepared for you. Now, it ought to be evident to everybody, you know, I mean, when you're here in our church or in another premillennial church and all the brethren that you fellowship with are, have the same view of end-time prophecy that you do, you have the tendency to think, well, everybody feels this way. But the fact is that the majority of professing Christendom is not premillennial in their eschatology or their study of end-time prophecy. The majority of them hold to the Augustinian school of, of uh, uh, allegorical interpretation. And as a result of this, and I'm, I'm talking about Catholics, Protestants, it doesn't matter what brand is on them, this is what they believe. The majority of them believe that God is through with his elect nation of Israel, number one. The second thing they believe is that the church is his new elect in oneness with the believing remnant and they have together replaced Israel. The Old Testament prophecies, number three, the promises to Israel now belong exclusively to the church, but they won't claim the curses. Oh, how odd. Number four, they say that there will be no thousand-year period where Christ physically reigns on this earth. And number five, they say that the book of Revelation is to be spiritualized as well as all the Old Testament prophecies that pertain uh, to the day of the Lord. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take Matthew chapter number 25, verses 31, 32 as a springboard. And you can turn there and hold on to that, but we're going to do a lot of other things before I get to that point, okay? Like I said, I'm going to give you a brief overview, and we're going to be moving quickly. And Jesus, uh, in Matthew 25, is describing the judgment of the nations. Now mark that. It's the judgment of the nations. Matthew 25 is actually a continuation of the discourse that he began in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, that's evident from the way it flows from Matthew 24, 51 into Matthew 25, verse number 1. So let's take a real quick look at Matthew 24. In Matthew 24... In verse number 3, the disciples said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? In verse number 4, Jesus warned them to take heed that no man deceive them. Verse 5, he said that many would come in his name, saying that I am Christ, and deceive many. Verse 6, he warned of rumor, wars and rumors of wars. In verse 7, he said, nation will rise against nation. He said there's going to be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 8, he summarizes all of these as the beginning of sorrows. In verse 9, he talks to the Jews specifically, saying, Then shall they afflict you and kill you, and ye shall be delivered up for my name's sake. In verse number 11, he warns about false prophets arising and deceiving many. In verse 12, he says that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And in verse 13, referring to this period of time that he later describes as the tribulation period in this same chapter, he said that he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. That's not the end of your physical life. That's the end of a period of time being described here in Matthew chapter number 24. Then he goes on down to say in uh, verse number 13, I mean, I'm verse number 14, that this gospel, this gospel, the gospel that he preached when he was on the earth, 
will be preached as a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. In Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 17, we see the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When he came on the scene, he came saying, for uh, uh, he began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the ministry that Jesus had to the Jews. The mystery of the church had not yet been revealed. They, they didn't understand, even though it was contained in the Old Testament, their eyes hadn't been opened, they hadn't been enlightened to that fact. So then when Peter stood up in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost and began to preach, what he preached was in actuality a continuation of the gospel that Jesus preached, that the kingdom of God was at hand. You see, he wanted them to know. He wanted them to understand that the Messiah had come, that the Messiah had suffered according to the scriptures, had been crucified, had been killed according to the scriptures, buried, and was raised again according to the scriptures, and that all that had been fulfilled, and that the time of his appearing could be at any moment. That's what he wanted to stress to them. If you look at Acts chapter 2, or just let me read it for you, because I'll be moving quick. In Acts chapter 2, in verses 16 through 20, Peter quotes the prophet Joel out of chapter number 2, verses 28 through 31, talking about uh, the Lord pouring out his spirit on all flesh, about showing signs in heaven above. In, uh, in, uh, in verse number 30, he quotes Psalm 132, 11, verses 34 and 35, quotes Psalm 110, 1. You see, he is going back to Old Testament prophecies and bringing them into his message to show Israel that Messiah had indeed come that he had indeed borne the iniquity of Israel and that he indeed was about to make his advent to be the king of the earth. And that is what the Israelites, what the Jewish believers all expected throughout the entirety of the first century. They looked universally for the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was their daily expectation that Jesus would come again for them. That's what they were looking for, for him to come, to set up his kingdom, and to rule and reign in righteousness on this earth. You see, Peter had not learned about the mystery of, uh, of the church. He'd not been taught this yet. That was a revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul, and Paul wrote about it in Romans 16.25 and 2 Corinthians 11.4. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 12, about how, how that the Lord gave him a specific mystery. He revealed to him the gospel that he preached. And it was separate from what anyone else had received prior to this revelation. In Galatians 2, 7, he speaks of the same thing. And in Ephesians 3, 1 through 7, and Philippians 4 and 15. If you take the time to look up those references, and I'll give them to you, you'll begin to see that there is a distinct difference in God's dealings with Israel under the old covenant and his dealings with the church under the new covenant. But although there are two distinct groups of people and there are two distinct sets of promises, they are all fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, because he is the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the consummation of God's prophetic program for the ages. And it's in Him that the hope, not only of Israel, but the hope of the Gentiles in this age lies. If you're not in Him, my friend, let me tell you, you are without hope. And hell will be your home someday. And I believe that when I look around me at the news and, and I view the things that are taking place in the world today, that the hour is rapidly approaching when the door is going to be closed yeah. on the gospel that's being preached by the church. Right. And you're going to enter into the tribulation period, and I'm telling you, you probably ain't going to make it, buddy. Right. If I were you, I'd get right today, today, today. Now, remember the question that the apostles put to Christ in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? 
And he, Jesus, said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own hour. You see, the Lord didn't say, No, boys, you don't get it. All that stuff is allegorical. It doesn't really mean what it says. You've got to be spiritual-minded to understand it. No, 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 no. You see, the problem is that most people... They, 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 what did Pete Ruckman used to say? He said, the Bible isn't hard to, to understand. It's just hard for most people to believe, and that's the problem, man. They don't want to believe the Word of God as it is written. They don't want to take the time to do what God commanded us to do in Isaiah 28, 10 through 13. He said that the word of God is to, was to Israel, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It ended up that little passage there by saying that uh, the reason he did that is so that they might go forward a little bit and stumble and be taken. It's so that the presumptuous cannot hope. To understand what the Bible says, but the meek and the humble and those who are submissive to God's word, it'll be clear to them. In in uh, First Corinthians two thirteen, he said that we have to compare spiritual things with spiritual, and that's what we're going to do today. You see. We have to realize that the Bible was not simply written for a bunch of people in the twenty first century. The Bible encompasses all of history and is addressed to all of humanity and addresses every problem, every situation, every ill that has ever come upon mankind. And it, it, it's so presumptuous of us to think, well, this is just for us and nobody else matters behind us and nobody before us matters or after us will matter. It's to us. It's not so. It's not so. Look. The Jews, as I was saying, they universally looked for the second coming of the Messiah. At home, I've got a copy that uh, 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 Harold Shursky used to own the deli downtown. Uh, I can't remember the name of the joint on Gay Street. Man, it was a good kosher deli. The old Harold Shursky, he's an 80-something-year-old Jew. He gave me a Jewish high holiday uh, 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 prayer book. And that thing's got transliterations in it, so I'm able to read some of it. And it is full of prayers for the second advent of the Messiah. Yeah. I mean, brother, they're looking for him. They rejected yeah. him the first time he was here, but they fully expect for him to come back. You see, right. the Bible said in Romans chapter 11, 25, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Yeah till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And it has happened in part to them. They see that a Messiah is coming. They don't see that he's already come. They see that he's going to reign. They don't see that he's to suffer. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, the Bible says, And when thy days, speaking to David, it says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Okay, now that's got a dual application. That's to Solomon, and that's to Jesus. But when you get on down into the rest of the passage, you'll see that some of them only have application to Jesus, and some only have an application to Solomon. Well, the, one, the second uh, verse there, 13, has a dual application. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Solomon built the temple of the Lord. He wouldn't allow David to do it because he was a bloody man, a man of war. What's Jesus doing right now? Why, brother, he's building a church. He's building a temple of the Lord. He's building a, a spiritual habitation of the Most High God. And if you're in him, you're in it. And he's in you. Hallelujah. Bro, I, man, I mean, that just, that's good. That's good. In verses uh, 14 through 15, these two apply to Solomon. He says, and, and to Jesus in a sense, that, that I will be his father and he shall be my son. But then you go on to the next line, which says, if he commit iniquity. We know that can only be Solomon. I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, 
whom I put away before thee. That's Solomon. But in verse 16, he says, And thine house, David, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And when that throne is established forever, it will be with the Lord Jesus Christ sitting upon it. The Lord said to David in Psalm 132, 11, The Lord has sworn in truth unto David of the fruit of thy body, Shall I, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, shall I, Jehovah, sit upon thy throne? Brother, that ain't Solomon. That ain't Solomon. Amen. Now, the promise is reaffirmed in the New Testament. And Luke uh, wrote about it in chapter 1, verse 31 through 33, when he said, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. In these verses, the promise is that the throne of David will be established forever with Christ sitting upon it, ruling over Israel and the earth as their king. Now, let's look what, at what the Lord said about David's throne back in the days when it was first established. In 1 Chronicles 29, 23, this is when David's, or when Solomon is, is, is anointed king for the second time. This is, this, this is what the word of God says about it. It says, then Solomon sat on the throne of the, David, no. On the throne of the kingdom of Israel? No. On the throne of the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Jehovah. On the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father and prospered. And all Israel obeyed him. You see, Israel, Israel was a true theocracy. The only one that's ever existed on the face of this earth. God was their king, and he ruled through his judges. The judges began to apostatize, to sin, to turn aside from the commandments of the Lord. And because of this, Israel got dissatisfied with the way things are going. Instead of beseeching God for, for better judges, they besought him for a king like the nations around him. So he gave them a king. They picked one out. They said that they... They, they picked out Saul, head and shoulders above every man. They picked him out based on his appearance. He just looked regal. He looked like a king. They thought, this is it. And sadly, though, as is always the case, when, when you choose a man based on his fleshly attributes, right. things go wrong. Amen, amen, amen. You see, God chose him a king differently after Saul had made a mess of everything. Saul, he took his prophet, he took Samuel, and he sends him down to see the sons of Jesse. And he's there, and here they come. Seven of them come walking before him. Man, I mean, big goodly men, strong men. Any, any of them could have been a king. And God said, no, nah, I don't want any of those. You see, because God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. And while that is a comfort in some situations, most of the time with me, it scares me to death. Because, <laughs> yeah, God does know your heart. And if you realize that, you'd guard your heart a little more carefully than you do. Amen. But David was a God after man, uh, a man after God's own heart. That's what it said in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. And as such, he was acceptable to the Lord. And through this man, God would establish his throne. Now, this throne is an earthly throne. It is a literal throne, and it is an unending throne. What greater assurance could have been given for this than, than the promise that was given in Psalm 132, 11, when God said that I'll sit on your throne to David. I mean, you, you can't get any more sure or secure than that when it comes to a promise. Now, some people, the amillennialists, uh, would in particular say that Jesus is sitting on that throne right now, but the fact of the matter is that he is not sitting on the throne of his glory today. He is not ruling and reigning as a king today. The Bible says in Revelation 3 and 21 that uh, to him, Jesus speaking, he said, to him that overcometh 
Will I sit? Will I grant to sit in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne today? Today, the man Christ Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, Amen. not beside it, brother. He's there with God, sitting with Him, equal with God, worshipped as God. As the angels and the, and the four and twenty elders and, and, and all the different creatures in heaven bow down and, and worship before them. He's there. He's there. But he has another throne that he is to occupy. And he'll do that, I believe, within our lifetimes. The, the Bible says in, uh, <clears throat> that he is presently engaged in the office of a high priest. That's why in Hebrews chapter number 4 verse 14 through 16, it talks about us uh, being able to, to come boldly to the throne of grace, to be, come boldly before our high priest at the throne of grace, that we may uh, uh, obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That he's not yet received his kingdom should be evident because in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, it said, uh, John wrote that, that, that what he's writing is from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. <laughs> Brother, he said that he is the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, what's a prince? A prince is one who is waiting. He's waiting until the appropriate time to ascend the throne. And that's what he's doing right now. Brother, the, 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 the rulers of this earth right now are the ones that Satan has placed in with God's permission. Jesus, Satan, he said, he offered Jesus all the kings of the earth. He said, they're mine. I can give them to whoever I want to. And that's true today. But, but just you wait. The day is coming, and I mean rapidly approaching, when everything's going to change, brothers. Everything is going to change. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. He's waiting to ascend the throne at the appropriate moment. And, 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 and Jesus, furthermore, he speaks of the throne of his glory being tied to the regeneration. And if the regeneration isn't what occurs for Israel at the second advent, I don't know what it is. You see, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of when in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So I think we pretty well established the fact that Jesus is not presently seated upon the throne of his glory. In the hour that we live right now, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This throne in Hebrews chapter 4 is called the throne of grace. If this throne is where he ministers to us as our great high priest that's passed into heaven. This throne is where he intercedes for us. This throne is where he strengthens us. This throne is where he administers grace to us that we might be able to live in a manner that's pleasing unto him. And I thank God for that throne of grace, brother. Oh, Lord, if it wasn't for that, God would have squished me like a bug long ago. Long ago. See, the thing is, like I said before, as Brother Ruckman said, this stuff's not hard to understand. A lot of people just have a real hard time believing it. They, they, they just they can't believe that, that it's like that. How can it be that way? It's got to be us, us. Uh, yeah, everything needs to be man-centered for them. Well, brother, the Bible ain't man-centered. The Bible is God-centered. Amen. And that, that has to do with salvation also. A lot of people have the mind that, that salvation is all about them. No, it ain't. It's all about him. Amen. Amen. It's, it's not so you can get heaven. It's so he can get glory. You getting heaven is a byproduct of it. Amen. Amen. He didn't do it to make you feel better. He did it to, to, to make manifest the riches of his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In Revelation chapter 1, 7, talking about the second advent, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Now, what I've read to you there sets uh, the second advent as distinct from the catching away of the church that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Because at, at, at the catching away, he comes, or, or I mean, at, at the catching away, he comes for the saints. At the second advent, he comes with the saints, according to Revelation 19, 14 and Jude 14. The second advent follows a time of great tribulation, according to Matthew 24, 21 and 22. And it's got a particular significance for the nation of Israel, not the church. At this time, at the time of the second advent, the national salvation of Israel will take place that Paul spoke of in Romans chapter number 11 and that's spoken of by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter number 12. He said in verses 9 through 11, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrim in the valley of Megiddo. Zechariah 13, 1 through 6 says, In that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to, to pass away. It goes on to say uh, in verse uh, uh, <clears throat> Number four, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then shall he answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The revelation of Jesus Christ is going to bring about the repentance of the nation of Israel. They will realize that they've rejected their Messiah and mourn over this great sin that they've committed. After enduring the tribulation for seven years, they're going to be delivered and the promises of God concerning their nation will be fulfilled. God is faithful Amen. and he has promised and he will perform it. He's not a man nor the son of man that he should lie. And brother, I don't know about you, but that gives me great confidence in what God has, is, and will do for me. If he's going to take care of Israel, despite all of their faults, if he's going to be faithful to his promise to them, oh my, I know I'm a getting in. You know why? Because just like Abraham in the beginning when God gave him the covenant, when he gave him the promise, I had believed God. And it was counted unto me for righteousness. Amen? Amen. I, I hold to God, but I don't hold nearly as much as I'm held. And if you're a Christian, you know that that's true too. Unless you're some kind of self-righteous idiot, man. I mean, you know, you're held. You're held. You're kept. You don't keep yourself. God keeps you. Now, each of the prophecies uh, that we've looked at are about Jesus Christ the Lord. And, of course, we know that. All prophecy is about Jesus Christ the Lord. I remember Roger preaching years ago and using this verse. It just hit me like a ton of bricks out of Revelation 19.10 that Jesus, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And brother, that's it. He is the aim. He's the center point. He's, he's the epitome. He's the peak. He's the culmination of every bit of it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Zechariah 14 has a lot to say about the second advent. I'm going to give you a real brief synopsis of that. In verses 1 through uh, 5 describe, describe the Lord coming down and standing on top of the Mount of Olives. Well, where have I read about the Lord on the Mount of Olives before? Wasn't that in Acts chapter 1, verse number 11? And he gathers all the nations of the earth together for battle. 
uh, in, in uh, let's see, verse uh, one, and according, and, and he's accompanied by the saints, as in Jude number f verse 14 and Revelations 19. Verse 6 through 11 tell of the restoration of the earth behind his advancing forces. I want you to picture this, man. Now, God's coming through uh, with a, a, a devouring fire. Whoosh! The Lord Jesus coming through. The fire is coming through and purging the earth. He comes through with his advancing forces. And the, from my understanding of this chapter, what's happening is after they walk through, the parched earth begins to spring forth and to, to, to blossom and life pops up everywhere that he has gone through and cleansed away the filth of the Antichrist reign. Yeah. Brother, I mean, that's just mind-blowing when you think about that stuff. And, uh, uh, it, and it also talks about the opening of that fountain we read about in Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. In the beginning of peace on earth, verses 12 through 15 tell the manner of death that befall the enemies of Israel and of God and the taking of the spoil by the victors. But it's the, the uh, remaining verses that have to do with the survivors of this great battle that pertain to our study of the judgment. Judgment in Matthew chapter 25. You see, because those that are left of the nations after the battle will then be judged. It says uh, that uh, things that are written in those verses describe uh, the beginning of a new era on this earth, one in which righteousness flows like a river and the desire of the Jewish nation has been realized. That sets the scene for Matthew 25, 31 through 32. So we see who the people are that are going to stand before the Lord in Matthew chapter 25. <clears throat> They're the people who survived the second advent. They're the ones who aren't destroyed out of, the, out of the nations when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance on the earth and on them who know not God. And in Matthew 25, verse 31, it says this. Now, here's the throne of his glory. It says, uh, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. That's everyone that's left of the nations that fought against Israel. All, all the survivors that are left will be gathered before him. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. At the revelation of the Son of God as king of the earth, one of his first acts will be to determine who is to allowed to enter this kingdom. This is when he is sitting on the throne of his glory. Revelation chapter eleven fifteen, referring to this day, says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now those who appear at this judgment, they were warned. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 11, we find these words. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to, pre to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Brother, I'm telling you, in the midst of all the crisis, calamity, and, 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 and global unrest that's going on, they're going to have a mighty angel flying through the heaven with a great voice telling them to fear God. Fear God. And the problem, <clears throat> the problem isn't that they don't believe that there's a God. Well, they know there's a God. The problem isn't that they haven't heard. They've got angels preaching a gospel yeah. to them. The problem isn't that they don't believe there's a God. The problem is that they won't repent. Amen. I know that that is a dirty word today. In much of Christendom, but I'm going to say it again. Repent, 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 repent. 
Jesus came on the scene saying, repent. John the Baptist said, repent and bring forth works. Meet for repentance. Paul in Acts chapter number 26, he told him that he preached repentance towards God and, and, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and to bring forth works, meet for repentance. My friend, repentance is an integral part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There, I said it. I know I'll be getting emails about that. Amen, amen, amen. But it's the truth. It's the truth. Anything less than that is half a gospel. It's half a gospel. Now, they were warned to repent, but they didn't. And those who refuse to trust in the Lord Jesus and disobey this gospel, they have sealed their fate, man. Revelation 16, 13 through 17 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, Come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Remember Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. The Lord, Jehovah, it says, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's Jesus. He comes down. He stands on the Mount of Olives. He gathers all the nations against him to do battle. That's what this is talking about. For they are the spirits of unclean beasts, uh, spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle to that great day of God Almighty. And it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And those who are left from this battle are the ones that must stand before Christ. Oh, at the throne of his glory. This is the general judgment that everybody mistakes for the white throne judgment. They are not the same. They are not the same. And I can tell you why. In Revelation chapter number 20, the people who are judged there are the dead. In Revelation chapter number 20, when they are judged, heaven and earth have fled away. The judgment... In uh, Revelation chapter number 20 is based upon what is recorded in books that are opened. This judgment is not the same. It's not the same. Those uh, uh, who, the, the ones who stand there on the Lord's right hand that I read about earlier, they're the ones who obeyed the everlasting gospel. They're the ones who overcame the beast by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They love not their lives unto the death. As recorded in Revelation chapter 12, 11. All those who receive the mark of the beast are going to be destroyed in the battle spoken of in Zechariah chapter 14, 1 through 15. Verse, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Joel chapter 2 and 3. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, 7 through 10. And Jude verses 14 and 15. And on and on and on it goes. But in Matthew 25, 33 through 40. It says, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Right. They're being judged based on how they treated Israel. Right. Israel, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, the mercy of God, the mercy of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
They're the apple of his eye, brethren. These Jews are the kinsmen. He's called them his brethren. They're his kinsmen according to the flesh. Because in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 3, that it says that, 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 that Jesus was made, made of the seed of David according to the flesh. <laughs> but proven to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, man. I mean to tell you, Jesus, he, he loves those Jews. They're his brethren. And, and the people who treat them right, they're going to be blessed. That was the promise that was given uh, in Genesis chapter number 12, verse 1 through 3, where it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. These are the ones who are counted worthy of life. And they're the subject of the last part of Zechariah chapter number 14, where it says, starting in verse 16, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and even upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not up that have no rain... There shall, that shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that will not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. These are physical Men and women, living, breathing, fleshly, men and living, men and women living in a physical kingdom who have to go to the tree of life for their healing, who have to go there for their sustenance to, 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 uh, to get their eternal life. See, they don't get the salvation. They don't get eternal life like we have it. We have Jesus. He that's joined into the Lord has become one spirit. We have him who is life yeah. abiding within us and we're joined together with him. It says uh, uh, we're flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone in the book of Ephesians chapter number four. Amen. It's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church is what Paul said. But these people, they, they are still living even in this blessed time of the millennium under the curse of Adam. How can I say that? Well, because at the end of the Millennium, the devil's loosed for a season, deceives the nations. He gets up an army and they go to fight God again. Yep. Brother, I'm telling you, they ain't like us. Amen. They're not like us. These are who we rule and reign over in the kingdom on the behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this, 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 this time, this time is the fulfillment of the everlasting covenant that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Now, let's look at the second advent one more time so we can tie it all together. I believe I've just got time to do this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. A parallel passage is found in Isaiah 66, verses 15 through 18. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouth shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts." It shall come that I will gather all nations in tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Mm. 
Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 through 42. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but give you an idea. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And it goes on to say down here, let's see, verse 37. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels. And them that transgress against me, I will bring them forth out of the country where they soldier, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Well, who's, gonna, who's, who's holding the rod they're passing under? Why, well, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, speaking of the woman who is Israel. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Brethren, that can be nobody. No, there's nobody else in the history of man that qualifies to meet that criteria but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he goes on. And uh, in Joel, he says, proclaim you this in chapter number three, verse nine, proclaim you this among the Gentiles, prepare war and wake up the mighty men. Let the men of war draw near, let them come up. That's the day when he returns. He's calling them to meet him in the valley of Armageddon. That's the great day of the Lord's wrath. You can find that in Jeremiah 10, 10. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 2. Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 14, 15. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Romans 1 and 18. Romans 2, 7 and 8. Revelation 6, 17. Revelation 19, 15. And on and on and on and on. You'd be amazed what a concordance will do for your knowledge of the Bible. You ought to get you one and use that thing. Seven long years, the day of the Lord's wrath is lasted, and it draws to a close, and a new kingdom's begun. A new kingdom has begun, and the Lord Jesus is sitting on his throne. He's already judged the righteous, and now he's going to call before him those who are referred to as goats. Down here, let's pick it up again in uh, verse number uh, 41. He's already judged those on his right hand. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also uh, answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, sick, or in prison, did not minister to thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not unto one of these, the one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Brethren, there is no general judgment that fits the white throne judgment scene. That's the general judgment of the survivors of the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've tried to give you a, a real brief overview of his second advent. And believe me, I have just barely scratched the surface. There are hundreds and hundreds of verses that have to do with this subject. And I want to tell you now. It, it, it's a very, uh, it's, a, mm, it's a purifying. What did, what did John say? Every man that hath this hope within him purifies himself, even as he is pure. You study this thing and you look at, at the world events. You look at where we're at in history. And brother, it's going to make you want to reach down and uh, knock the dirt off your shoes, so to speak. You know, make sure your hair is right. It, be ready. Be ready. Remember in the book of Revelation uh, 19, I believe it is, it, it says uh, that the bride hath made herself ready. <laughs> Amen. Let's get ready. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you now for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord. I know that I moved quickly, but God, we have the advantage of being able to, to, to uh, listen to tapes or CDs or whatever of it so that people can run the references I've given and I pray now that this will do for them, for their hearts, what it's done for mine. Lord, bless the service that's to come today. 
I pray that you'll be with our pastor, Lord. Strength him, supply every need that he has. We love you, Lord, and we, we seek, we desire your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless you.